I guess that way. It's good. Thank you very much. You know. <laughs> that was it. Seven minutes. They applauded. It was over. You missed it. All right. Change is difficult because we like routine. That morning cup of coffee, the morning run, checking our iPhones before we get out of bed, right? Fear is an obstacle to change. Fear of the unknown, the new, of breaking that script. And when we read about change, it can be overwhelming. Take, for example, Tacoma, Washington. The school district solved their homelessness problem in order to help their students. Or you read about a teacher in the Bronx, New York, who quit her job to start a whole foundation to help her students. Well, this is my story of change. I used to joke that I taught for 11 years in public school in five different jobs. You're doing the math. Yep, I did not hold tenure. <laughs> but now that I'm in a single job for the last seven years, I have some perspective on that time. I was the change that schools didn't like. So when I ran up against the wall, I just changed jobs. <laughs> Take, for example, year three teaching middle school. My students are working in groups, working on tasks, sharing ideas. And at the end of the year, the principal says to me, your test scores aren't high enough. Teach like the teacher down the hall. More skills. Put the kids in rows. But how did that explain one of my students' pile? Who one day in my class was trying to figure out Farmer Ben and his cows and ducks. She had the right number of legs but the wrong number of animals. She looks up at me, big brown eyes, oversized glasses, and she goes, I'm just gonna cut a cow in half and make two ducks. Genius. So of course now next year I'm teaching in a new school district, new job, AP Calculus, same story. My students are at the board solving problems. I'm standing in the back of the classroom asking questions. Three weeks into the job, my supervisor says, you don't teach. I'm like, uh, I thought I was supposed to guide their thinking, support their reasoning. So what if I do it from the back of the classroom? They're taking the AP exam. They have to do the questions, not me. What's the big deal? What's going on? See, sometimes when people put up walls to prevent change, they actually hide change that's going on. In my next job, a student comes up to me and says, hey, you're in a book. I'm like, no way. But it turns out a student of mine had their college application essay published. And in it, they described how they thrived in that AP calculus class where I was told I didn't teach. You see, it's not about administrators and test scores. My point is, it's about our students. So at this point, I got tired of fighting administrators. I did the only thing I could possibly do. I became an administrator. But now, I faced new walls, teachers who did not want to change. And one of my three jobs as a supervisor, I spent two years documenting a teacher's resistance to change just to try and make a crack in that wall. Now, I'm a teacher educator. I'm trying to change the teaching in the next generation. But I find myself on the other side of the same walls. Because I get these mentor teachers who say things like this to my student teachers. That's enough with the group work. It's time to lecture. Those are low-level students. They can't problem solve, so just give them some worksheets. So where is this change? I walk down the halls of high schools and middle schools by me, and kids are still in rows, and teachers are doing the math at the board. You see, when so I'm here to ask you, to be an agent of change, because my pre-service teachers can't do it alone. There will always be walls in their way. When you are awesome in your classroom and only in your classroom, you create inequity in the students in your school and the next generation. You need to tell your story. You need to share the change that you are trying to make. When your colleagues are using ineffective practices that we know don't work from the research, but you're on the other side using practices that do work, right? we create this achievement gap in our students. There will always be walls in their way. So we need to advocate for change. And it needs to start 
with us personally. Am I changing? Am I a lifelong learner? We need to tell our students why their classroom is changing. My students used to always say, why are you making us do problems at the board? And I'd say, listen, if you're going to be a leader someday, you're going to have to convince somebody of something. So convince me you can solve this math problem and you'll have the skills that you need in your future. Your colleagues cannot work in isolation. You cannot let them use ineffective practices. When they're at professional development and they're checking their email or shopping online, we all know it happens, right? It's their students who lose. So you can't let that happen. All students deserve highly effective teachers. All students deserve to be in classrooms full of rich tasks and discussion. Parents. Lots of fun, right? Oh, actually, administrators first, I guess. They need to see the change. <laughs> When they come running into your classroom because two kids are yelling and screaming about how many pizza toppings to make, this actually happened, you just look at them and go, what, they're being mathematicians. I don't see the problem. Now on to parents. They need to understand that you cannot teach them the way that they learned it because we're preparing them for jobs that don't exist or better yet, ones that they create themselves. Everyone needs to understand the change because we need to get rid of the phrase, I am bad at math, because we know that if we have the right mindset, everyone can learn. Agents of change are disruptive, but we have known for over 20 years how kids should experience mathematics in research and in standards, yet their implementation is the exception to the rule, and it's now time that the exception becomes the rule. So be an agent of change. It is not an easy path, but it is the right path for our students' success. I am still on my journey of change, and this time I'm sticking around until I break down those walls. So will you join me? Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Alice Fisher, and I teach computer science. I'm going to share a few ideas about giving students space to stumble. In other words, allowing them to learn from their mistakes in a low-stakes environment. Before I begin talking about my students, I'd like to share a little bit about myself. This is me at age six. I know, pretty adorable. <laughs> and these are my parents, who have always been very loving people. But when I was six, I got caught crumpling worksheets that I didn't get 100% on and hiding them in my closet. When I look back, I think, wow, what, why did I feel such pressure to not be, to be perfect, even at age six? I'm not sure where that pressure came from, parents, school, myself. Whatever was the source, we teachers have students like myself at age six who are afraid to fail because the stakes can seem so high. Sometimes the student's perception reflects elements of the academic landscape they live in. In Texas, if you graduate in the top 10th or even the 6th percentile in some schools, you receive automatic admission to Texas public universities. And whether you're from Texas, we know that college admissions have been more and more competitive. So with this in mind, this brings me to the question. How do I carve space in my classroom so that students feel safe to make mistakes, take risks, ask questions, and trust us as teachers to have their best interest and growth in mind? For as Jessica Leahy discusses in her book, The Gift of Failure, small failures when the stakes are relatively low and the potential for emotional and cognitive growth is high are called desirable difficulties. Learning that comes with challenge is stored more effectively and more durably in the brain than learning that comes easily. We want our students to stumble because that is how they best learn. Now at this point, we could start discussing alternative methods of grading, such as competency-based grading or standards-based grading, but I only have four minutes. So even if you grade traditionally, how do we carve these safe spaces for students to stumble? I will now discuss a few strategies I use in my AP Computer Science A course, which is learning to program in Java 
and unfortunately, we can see that traditionally, it's been underrepresented with fe from female and minority students. So strategy number one, reinforce the message that learning is iterative. Give students the opportunity to learn through a second iteration of an exam. While I was grading a free response question exam late last fall, I thought to myself, why should I be making detailed notes of all the errors that the students are making when the students can be making these notes and learning from their mistakes? And so this is what I did. If the students wrote code correctly, minus a few minor syntax errors, I gave them a check plus, and if not, I left it blank. When the students received their exam back, they also received a handout for the second iteration of their exam. On the handout, they were assigned to debug their code and write the revised code in the box provided if they didn't receive a check plus. Now, they were all required to type their code and test with test cases. They documented their errors, explained how they debugged their code, whether it was due to incorrect syntax or incorrect logic. And I actually only took a grade on the second iteration of their exam. Strategy number two spiraling past content into more recent assessments and replacing past assessment scores with more recent assessment scores if they show evidence of growth in the spirit of standards-based testing. For example, I gave a quiz and the majority of my students didn't do that great. So the next test I gave had two parts. Part one consisted of 10 multiple choice questions that spiraled the content from the previous quiz and part two is new content. Now, I graded part one, and if the percent of that section was higher, I replaced the past quiz's score with a new score. And of course, the students did better the second iteration and learned the content at a deeper level. Strategy number three, encourage peer tutoring and collaboration. When I gave that second iteration of that exam, I gave some students stickers so that they would give those to peers that help them understand the problem better. And those peers received little prizes like Hershey Kisses and Erasers, which sent the message that I really value helping each other out. We also do group activities, such as posters, where the students can talk about certain topics. And this helps create a community of learning in the classroom. Strategy number four, and this is a tough one. Acknowledge mistakes that I've made and how I've learned from student questions. This is the first year I've taught AP Computer Science A, and I've definitely done my share of stumbling. Although it can be humbling, I've learned to incorporate my mistakes as a learning lesson for students. When I taught the topic of private access, I didn't quite understand that private fields have class level and not object level access. One of my students asked a question that revealed the limits of my understanding, so I incorporated her question into the next day's lesson and acknowledged her in my, my research into the topic, which resulted in better understanding. I'll end with a quote. Learning is deeper and more durable when it is effortful. Learning that's easy is like writing in the sand, here today, gone tomorrow. Buddhist monks create and then destroy intricate sand art to symbolize the imperman impermanence of life. We educators know about impermanence in education. We want to be the stability in our student lives and provide them space to grow, take risks, and learn at a deeper level so that their understanding can take root and endure beyond our classroom doors. Thank you. Um, what I want to share with you is uh, not going to be exciting or amazing to you. It's going to be exciting and amazing to me because those are things that I discovered uh, in my life that made me hopefully a better educator. And it also has to do with overcoming the imposter syndrome. <clears throat> uh, this is a group photo of the Albert Einstein Fellows from uh, last year. Um, and I was somehow fortunate enough to be selected. I am the uh, Mexican looking guy on the right side. <laughs> And uh, where do they come from? Well, they came from all over the place. Nathan from Utah, Aida from Florida, China from New York, Alejandra from Maryland, me from Texas, Kayla from Ohio, Rebecca from Alaska, Doug from uh, Maine, Jennifer Lane from New Jersey, Jennifer Mayo from Oregon, 
Wanda from New York, Sharon from Hawaii, and Adam from Oregon. But how did we get there? I mean, what, what happened in our lives that allowed us to be in that wonderful experience? Well, first of all, it's not just us. There were a lot of people that helped us, that helped us get there. Uh, a lot of people that were influential in our lives. Who were those giants in my life? Well, first we start with this uh, one, uh, wonderful gentleman, Frank Devon and Bert Waits. First time I got exposed to them was 1992. Frank DeMana was, uh, I don't know why, he went to Laredo, Texas and did a workshop. He found Laredo somehow, and he did a workshop on the TI-81. I was hooked because I was using Casio 7000 at the time. It was like night and day switching to this wonderful machine. What caught my attention? Well, I saw that now I could graph parabolas in a different way. I could show a parametric representation and actually see the ball moving up and down, which I thought was very amazing. Then I discovered Tommy Eats in 19, 1993. Uh, Tommy um, was instructor for C-squared PC. This is one of his quotes. Rational functions are just polynomial functions with a few interesting places. <laughs> Before him, I was doing rational functions just by memorizing the definition from the book, but I had no idea what rational functions were. And this is one that he shared. He said, what is that? And I said, well, it's a quadratic function. Looks pretty nice. And that one, I think that's like a rational function. And that one, uh, maybe reciprocal, I don't know. And then he shared this with me. That's the equation for all three of them. Just different viewing windows. Amazing. I was totally hooked. Then I met Arnie in 1994 in Fort Worth, Texas. I just couldn't believe that somebody could know so much geometry. How is that possible that a human being can know so much geometry? The quote that I'm going to share is not from me. It's from an educator that actually admired Arnie and went to visit him in his classroom. After I was back in Japan, Arnie sent me an email saying that uh, all groups reached the correct solution. Arnie did not teach anything. I had noticed that he was trying to teach knowledge to students, but uh, he helped me realize that students obtain more, much more than he was trying to teach. He knows a secret of teaching, which is a joy of teaching without teaching. Isn't that amazing? Shin Watanabe, Tokai University. Then Michael Kidd comes along in 1995. We are in the Valley in Edinburgh, and I'm going to do an algebra institute with a TI-83 or 82, I don't remember which one. And he was going to do the first summer institute using this wonderful machine, the TI-92. He was a guru of the TI-92. And what blew my mind is one time when he told me, do you know that there are over 600 centers for a triangle? Again, very amazing. I was hooked again. Then John Hanna comes along, circa 1111001111. <laughs> and what amazed me about John is that it didn't matter when I saw him, if I asked him a question about coding or programming, he never said, uh, sorry Juan, I don't have time right now. He always had time for me. And we came up with a clock that actually worked, the hands, the hour hand and the minute hand. I actually did it with his help, but somehow he says that we collaborated. I don't know. <laughs> Ellen Hook, I met her in 2000, and Ellen was giving us a workshop on how to become a better instructor. And this is one quote that I remember from Ellen. She actually invited me to go to Puerto Rico and do the Algebra Institute in Spanish. Tommy had done it in English, but the instructors from Puerto Rico wanted also the Spanish version. Uh, and this is something that I remember from her. The first 15 minutes, you can get away with charm. After that, you better damn well know something. <laughs> <laughs> then I meet Sister Alice. Around 2001, something like that, uh, we did a tribute for her. Uh, and this is at the, at the convent. I was very lucky to visit with her at the convent. My wife, my kids are there. And the amazing thing was she said, we're going to share a beer together. And we had a beer. Imagine that, a beer with Sister Alice, right? <laughs> and this is one thing that happened, one of the quotes I remember, when she was offered pretty much anything she wanted for her classroom. When she was asked, what do you need? She said, a year's supply of chalk would be nice. Isn't that cool, right? Then Tom Reardon comes along. I met him in Calgary in 2002, and he's using a smart board, and he has this thing that he presses a button, and the calculator actually works in the thing. I thought it was a transparency. No, it was a TN92 working as an emulator. And I asked him a question about the, uh, the smart board, and he gave me some ideas how to get a grant, so two years later I got it. And this is a quote that I remember from him. I don't give homework. I give OTLs, opportunities to learn, right? It's pretty cool. I started using that. And then Marco Barrales comes along, 2002 also. Marco is a Chilean educator, and he invited me to go to Chile, to Concepcion, teaches at a German, German school. He's also a very good geometrician. And um, Marco has this interesting quote. 
Las matemáticas son las vitaminas de la inteligencia y la inteligencia la espada para vencer los obstáculos de la vida. Translation. Mathematics is the vitamins for the intelligence. And intelligence is the sword you need to overcome the obstacles of life. And what he shared with me, uh, among many other things, is this wonderful theorem, Viviani's theorem. When he showed it to me, he was an expert with a Cabri Jr. And he's telling me, yeah, if you draw the altitudes of, uh, with a random point inside a triangle, you add them up, the sums, regardless of where the point is, always give you the same thing as the height of the altitude of the triangle. Again, I was hooked. So all of these things I've learned from other people, nothing from me. So I was standing on the shoulders of giants. So what you have to remember is that mathematics is not something you learn. Mathematics is something you do. And thanks to all these wonderful educators, I think I became a better math educator. Thank you very much. Come with me into my classroom. I was so excited about using my new calculator technology with geometry software built right in. My students completed an exploration on similar triangles and everything went well. The next week, however, on the unit test, the students did not remember the concepts they had investigated in the lab. I was so disappointed. How could my well-planned lesson have fallen so flat? Using great technology was not enough to make the math concepts stick for my students. They remembered using the calculators, but not the lesson objectives. It happened to me. Has it happened to you? In thinking about what I could have done differently, I learned about the power of the action consequence reflection cycle. When students go through this process, it makes their learning deeper and makes it stick. Let's take a closer look at the stages. Students perform a mathematical action, observe a mathematical consequence, and reflect upon the result, making connections and making sense of the underlying math concepts. What does it mean to perform a mathematical action? Students can make a change to a graph, drag a vertex of a geometric figure, generate a list of numbers, or operate on a symbolic expression. To perform an action, essentially, students are using dynamic elements of technology to change the objects with which they are working. The consequence stage means that students ask and answer the following questions. What did you observe? What changes? What stays the same? Finally, reflection. We want students to reflect on their results and reason about the underlying mathematical concepts. This reflection piece of the process is really, really important. It is the key to making student learning deeper and more durable. This reflection step, you can't just leave to chance that the students are going to reflect on what they've observed. And if they reflect, they might not be reflecting on what you think they should be reflecting on. So there are lots of strategies you can use to get this reflection piece. You can have them record their results in a lab activity or a handout or in their notebook, or in a class summary on the board or on chart paper around the room. You can have them answering questions, discussing implications in small groups, and making predictions. In general, you want them to be able to communicate their thinking, orally or in writing, individually, in small groups, or as a whole class? What questions can we as teachers ask to foster reflection and help students engage in the process? What will happen if I do this? What must I change to make something happen? How is one thing affected by another thing? What changes? What stays the same? When will something be true? And why do you think this happens? So here's an example. I might have as a learning goal for my students to understand how the parameter a affects the graph of the function a times x squared. Instead of me telling the students the rule, they graph several functions using technology. They might use a slider, the transformation graphing app, or simply graph successive functions. Here are the questions I want the students to consider. What will happen if a gets bigger? What must you do to make the parabola wider? What must you change to turn the parabola upside down? What do you predict 1 half x squared will look like compared to 1 tenth x squared? 
Here's another example. Move down the columns of the table. How do the values grow? How are linear and exponential growth similar and different? Students can use the ask auto setting to observe the growth or use the auto ask setting to make predictions. The next example uses TI Inspire CAS. What happens to the exponents when I multiply with the same base? What is x squared times x cubed? x squared times x to the fourth? x to the third times x to the fifth? Is there a pattern that you notice? What can you try next to test your conjecture? Finally, look for invariants, shapes or quantities that don't change while other things are changing. What happens to the interior and exterior angles of a triangle as the triangle shape changes? What happens to the sums of the angles? What is the sum of the sine squared plus the cosine squared of different size angles? Why do you think this might be true? Can you justify the result? Making reflection part of your classroom process means holding students accountable for making their thinking visible. Record your observations. Restate and clarify another student's thinking. Compare and contrast your reasoning with someone else's. Do you agree? Can you convince me? Does anyone want to add to that? I wonder if it would always work. And how do you know? Use wait time. Don't steal another student's opportunity to reflect by talking too soon. And once the lesson is done, the teacher or the students summarize the lesson for the class, insist that students record key concepts in their notes and not just write it on the handout that gets handed in. The book, Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning, lists reflection as one of several strategies to reach a learning goal. Leverage these techniques to learn more effectively. Brown says, Reflection is a combination of retrieval practice and elaboration that adds layers to learning and strengthens skills. Reflection is the act of taking a few minutes to review what has been learned and asking yourself questions. The power of technology alone was not enough to guarantee that my students understood the math. But when I harnessed the power of the action, consequence, reflection cycle, I was able to make the math stick for my students' success. Thank you very much. Okay, what can happen when student thinking is visible in your classroom? This is the story of an incredible journey of one school in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, eh? This is a graph of our provincial grade nine math assessment scores. We track the percent of students who achieve level three or four. The blue represents the academic or university stream, and the green, the applied or community college stream. Something profound happened between 2009 and 2014. In 2009, we introduced our teachers and students to TI Inspire and TI Navigator. Our teachers dove headlong into learning about the pedagogical possibilities of Inspire and Navigator. They attended countless PD sessions, summer workshops, and T-Cubed International conferences. We became an incredible learning community where all our teachers were invested and successful. We quickly saw that Navigator allowed student thinking to bubble up and surface and become visible and actionable in real time for our teachers. We truly had a window into student thinking. Navigator was a safe and anonymous environment for all our students. Then, sadly, in 2014, our school decided to adopt iPads, which meant we lost Navigator. Thankfully, our students still had the TI Inspire iPad app, but we lost the power of Navigator to make student thinking visible. Thus began our quest for a Navigator replacement. So initially we thought this was gonna be a technological solution, but surprisingly our quest led us to a non-technological solution. Our classes began to look like this. I'll call this the thinking classroom. 
As we moved away from Navigator and towards the thinking classroom, we realized how both were such powerful vehicles for allowing student thinking to bubble up, surface, and become visible and actionable in real time, albeit in subtly different ways. The thinking classroom framework comes from the research of Dr. Peter Lilliadal, a math education researcher from Simon Fraser University. As you can see in the picture, our students are working at vertical surfaces. This is a critical aspect of the thinking classroom, as it makes student thinking visible to the teacher and all the students, unlike horizontal surfaces. Non-permanent surfaces, like whiteboards, blackboards, or windows, ensure that students are willing to take risks without fear of making mistakes, since they can just erase it. This is very different than using permanent markers on a chart, uh, chart paper on a table. Peter calls this vertical non-permanent surfaces, and what would this be without an acronym, VNPS. Um, please beware, this is very different than use, uh, this, is, this is a lot more than just slapping a bunch of whiteboards up on, in your class. Lastly, students, when they come to class, are greeted by the teacher who hands them a card that is their group of three for that day. Groups change every day. Peter calls this visibly random groups. Yet another acronym, VRG. Teachers latched onto this framework very quickly and successfully since, I believe, they intuitively saw that this was the Navigator replacement that they had been searching for. It's worth noting my role as a teacher has fundamentally changed in a thinking classroom. I am focused on ensuring that my students maintain something called a state of flow. Flow is this beautiful place between when there's a balance between challenge and skill. You know when your teenage son is engrossed in their video games and they lose all track of time? That's flow. It is my role to watch the flow of thinking and ideas and to decide when to intervene to help prevent frustration or up the challenge to help avoid boredom. So students are back in the beautiful yellow flow zone. It's worth noting, students quite often get themselves back into flow. For example, by looking at another group's work or going and talking to another group. All our teachers readily bought into the thinking classroom and have met with incredible success. Teachers saw immediate positive impact in their teaching, in all their students' learning and their students' engagement. The real power of TI Navigator in the thinking classroom is not our increased test scores. The power lives in the transformation of our math teachers and the incredible impact this has had on our thousands of students this past decade. Looking ahead, my hope and challenge for you is that you might discover the power, beauty, and magic that comes from making the thinking of your students visible using TI Navigator or the thinking classroom. Thank you. So we hear a lot about we need to get more students interested in STEM. But I'm here to talk about what do we do as teachers in our high school classroom to promote equity and increase the numbers of underrepresented groups in STEM. So if you're thinking, why do we need to do this? Well, only 13% of engineers are female. Now, back when I was in college, and there were very few females, I thought that by now, it'd be a lot better. If you look at Hispanics, that's 11%, African Americans, 9%. So that means combined, African Americans and Hispanics only make up 20% of engineers right now. So I think, well, why is this? So what I want you to do is close your eyes, think, what do you see when you think of an engineer, a physicist, a scientist? Then look up here. Lots of our students see images like these. Well, quite frankly, I don't see myself up there or anybody that looks like me. And so why would I go and 
go into one of these fields. When I took my kids to see cars, and my daughter was four, she looked over at me during the movie and she said, Mommy, where are all the girl cars? And I thought, whoa. She's making decisions at four years old based on the things that she's seeing about what she can do in her life. And that's true for a lot of kids. But I didn't realize it in the same way until my own daughter said it. So I want to know, what can we do to change the images that we have to be more like these people? These are all some of my former students who are engineers and scientists. So I asked them, hey, what can we do? What advice can I offer to you? And they said, these are the things that we can do. One, we need to recruit students and support them. Number two, people can be diverse. They can be dancers, cheerleaders, musicians, football players, as we saw today, and still be good in math and science. We need to provide challenges, but at the same time, we need to support our students. We need to encourage that growth mindset that we're hearing a lot about. And we need to design our courses to provide an environment that promotes success for all and not just for some students. Travon, he said, don't forget to tell him how you found me in the hallway after class has already started. Drag me in and made me take your class. And then he got a five on the AP physics exam. Wouldn't have done that had he not been in there. We look for kids in our building. We work as a team. We use AP potential, but we also talk to each other to find people and encourage them to take the highest level classes that they can and then support them to help them be more successful. Sarah said I helped her realize, you know, she's a PhD in physics working at the National Lab in Los Alamos. She said I helped her realize that she can be girly and still be in physics. So I told her some stories about my experiences, especially in physics, more so in math. And here's a couple of those stories. One of them, I was at the American Association of Physics Teachers making a presentation about 20 years ago. And I went in the restroom, and a woman came up to me and she said, you're wearing nail polish. And I said, yeah. And she said, women don't wear nail polish at the AAPT meetings if they want to be taken seriously. And I looked at her and I said, you're wearing nail polish. And she said, I know, I'm so excited to meet you. And we've been <laughs> friends for, <laughs> we've been friends for 20 years. Um, at one of the other meetings for AAPT, I was sitting in the audience and it was a sharing session and a male teacher got up and he said, this is a demo I do with my conceptual physics class. You know, the one with all the football players and cheerleaders in it? Well, as a former cheerleader, I was not happy. So I chased him down after the session. I'm sure I was not as intimidating as John Urschel, but I said, hey, I was a cheerleader, and I don't know what you're saying, but this is offensive, and I have AP students who are cheerleaders and football players in AP physics, and I want to know why you don't. I chased him down the hall. He finally escaped to the men's room. Um, but these expectations we know impact our students. And so when we have those expectations, a lot of times they see those. Sarah was in an on-level geometry class until her teacher encouraged her to come in. Um, Daniel says, we need to care about our kids and help them. That as an immigrant, a lot of his parents, his parents didn't know how to help him. But his teachers helped him and encouraged him. Emily said, it's really more fun and exciting when we work on something that's difficult and succeed in that than when we succeed in something that we know everybody can do. So I encourage students to do that. Whew. Okay. We need to um, expose students to real world data, collect data with them, show them real world problems, because as Gustavo says, the real world is all we have and there's no solution manual out there. Um, Amritha said we need to support our students and allow them to make mistakes, which is what we keep hearing. But if that's what we believe, then we need to create a classroom that does that. So we allow test corrections no matter what. If a student makes 95, they can still get extra credit and come in and learn the things that they didn't learn. Okay? They don't have to know it all the first time, and we encourage that all the time. Sophia says we need to encourage a growth mindset that a lot of students think some people get it and they just, they have it. They don't realize all the hard work that goes in to those students being able to really understand it and how much thinking and all that stuff that they do. And so as we keep hearing, we need to encourage that growth mindset. We did design our courses for success. Now, this is on my board in my classroom all year long for AP Physics. You only need to get about 60% right to get a five on the AP Physics exam, and about 50% right to get a four. 
So why should I create my tests where students have to get 90 or 80 percent right? Okay, I make my tests out of 120, sometimes 140 points to allow them to make mistakes. Then they come in and correct and learn how to do the things that they didn't know how to do before. It encourages them that it's okay that they don't know everything, that they come back and learn it, and I give them incentives to come back and do that. Finally, we need to encourage students to work together. Our leadership team at our school talked to our faculty and said, create a seating chart like Ms. Antonome does. Put students in groups together. Don't let them choose their own seats because we know that they're gonna segregate by race, by socioeconomic level, and by the people that they know. We have a moral obligation to move kids around and help them get to know each other. And when they do, they said, we didn't want to change groups at the end. We made new friends. By the end of the year, we felt like it was a family. These are the choices that we make in our classrooms that can impact a lot of these students. Some of them have come back and said, I'm not feeling this in other classrooms, so this is what we need to do. We can't control everything, but we as classroom teachers can design our classes and our, um, use our influence to help level the field in STEM. So let's go out, change the world, bring more kids in. Thank you. So I'll go ahead and get started. We'll talk about the value of relationships in education. I'm going to start with some key findings from the National Center for Education Statistics. They found that 17% of teachers that started teaching in 2007 were no longer in the profession by 2011. Salary made a difference. There was about a 9% difference if you were above or below $40,000. And that degrees had little impact, only about a 3% difference. Finally, though, the biggest thing was that mentoring had a huge impact, about a 15% difference between those with a mentor versus those without a mentor. Moving on, a few more key findings from the Learning Policy Institute. They talked a little bit about, pardon me, is there a problem? And I don't really need to listen to somebody read off a PowerPoint, but thanks for your time. You don't think this research is important? Of course it's important. I wouldn't have chosen this session, but given that you only have seven minutes, don't you think there's a better way to get your point across? Yeah, like you could do any better. Um, look at all these people on their phones. I'd at least engage my audience a little. <laughs> I've got five minutes left. What do you want me to do? Rework this whole thing on the fly? I mean, I don't know. Since you're such the expert up there, why don't you tell these people why you stayed as a teacher today? Okay. All right. Well, a couple things. First, I make major changes every five, ten years, like changing classes, changing jobs. Um, I also keep a good sense of humor, especially about somebody who interrupts me all the time. <clears throat> well, you know what, Corey Bobby? I think you're probably missing the most important thing. Yeah. What's that? The relationship between you and me. <laughs> <laughs> Hi guys, how are y'all doing today? How's all this sitting and listening? Is it going awesome for you? <laughs> I am Jana Young, and I am also a high school math teacher in Arkansas, and oh, I am Corey Bobby's buddy. Aren't you supposed to be over here? I'm, I, I don't know where what I'm supposed doing? to be. I don't know. Um, we, <laughs> we, um, we're here today to talk about how professional relationships make all the difference in your career. When we first met, I was a math specialist in the state of Arkansas, and somebody had given my name to Jana because she was a young teacher trying to integrate cl calculators into her classroom. It was 2005, <laughs> and I was a brand new teacher, definitely overstepping myself, and I could have used a med excuse me, I could have used a mentor Men at that point. How about that? That would work. <laughs> um, I was really impressed by Jana. She was really creative. She was really ambitious. But most of all, she was a big know-it-all. <laughs> this is going to be awesome, guys. Um, OK, so I continue going to Corey's sessions so that I can learn how to integrate those calculators into my classroom. And she kept interrupting me while I was teaching. Um, but during those three years that we were in a lot of workshops together, um, I started to want to go back to the classroom. I started missing having my own students and finally got the chance to do so and teach alongside Jana. We got to be classroom neighbors for five years. During that time, we were able to teach a lot of the same classes. We had a lot of discussions, like the one you just saw. Um, <laughs> discussions. <laughs> they challenged, Jana challenged me, and I challenged her. They, we uh, forced ourselves to grow and change and made us into the teachers we are today. And then you know what happened, you guys? Corey divorced me. Oh my god, <laughs> I did not. I'm just saying, that's what happened. OK, well, he left me for another school. <laughs> 
I did tell you that change was one of my ingredients you for survival. You know what? You know what? Not, let's not argue. Let's just keep going. Okay. Okay. Right. Let's talk about the impact of losing that great teacher. When a, new, a great teacher leaves you, it impacts your school. It costs time and money to replace them, but most importantly, getting a new teacher changes the culture of a school for good or for bad. Also, it changes your department. I want you to think of that person who's no longer in your department. What have you lost because she's not there anymore? I can definitely speak for, from personal experience that when Corey decided to switch schools, it left me without my ride or die throughout the school day. And I know that I miss Jana and I can't just run next door when something blows up in my face and have her help me fix it. The most important thing that we're going to lose out by losing a new teacher is it's how it's going to infect, affect our kids. And I will say that when a teacher leaves, they often leave big shoes to fill. And you know, the two students may never get over that. So we're going to spend a few minutes telling you why we stay. Combined, Jana and I have taught for almost 35 years. Um, we don't look it, but we have. Um, <laughs> we love our content. We're big math nerds. We know not everybody loves math, but we want our students to see our passion. And when that light bulb goes in their eyes, goes on in their eyes, our day is made. We also love our schools. We love Friday night football and the Salt Bowl. We love the Spring Musical and the Feast, tennis matches and golf. Or we've learned to fake it. That's, <laughs> that is true. <laughs> Finally, we love our kids. No matter if you're a teacher, a principal, or even the resource officer, you're in this for the kids. Jana and I love being around our kids, and they're the reason we find joy in our job. And if you don't love being around kids, maybe you should write a math textbook or make some online math videos. I, I can do that too. <laughs> of course you can. <laughs> okay, finally we want to talk about how we help others to stay. I believe in meaningful PD. I've taught math PD for 20 years and valuable PD can energize your classroom. I've learned as much from my participants as I share. That's why I love to be a presenter. Jana's a perfect example of how relationships can be changed through professional development and it all started in a T-cubed workshop. In fact, your future math buddy could be sitting next to you right now. Second, it's time for us to foster relationships with our colleagues. The, the teachers that are in your district and your neighboring districts, they're there to support you. And without them, you're like an island. And you're, you will not foster in that environment. And it's incumbent upon us to look for those islands and bridge, build bridges. At times, I've been Jana's life preserver, and other times, she's been mine. When was the last time you saved a life? Finally, it is so important for us to bring life to our classrooms. You know, if you are bored teaching it, your students are bored learning it, and that's just how it is. And so if you can make your classroom an exciting place, it's not going to just affect you and your students. It's going to affect your department and your school and even surrounding schools. We all know that education is all about relationships, but so often we focus only on our relationships with students. Please foster those relationships with your colleagues as well. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming and listening to us, you guys, and as always, putting up with Corey's arrogance. <laughs> <laughs>